Thank you, uh, David. It's, it's indeed a, a, an honor and a privilege to be here at the Advantage New Zealand Conference and to follow the Prime Minister uh, of your country. That has not happened to me uh, before, so I'm deeply honored about that. Uh, this is obviously an important conference as this country uh, comes to grips with the challenges of developing uh, natural resources and regulating those resources uh, appropriately. Um, I'm here to talk about um, our recent experience uh, in the U.S., uh, and in particular our experience following uh, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy in 2010. Uh, as most of you know, it was almost exactly three years ago that there was a blowout followed by explosions uh, and fires uh, that ultimately led to the deaths of 11 people and the largest uh, oil spell in United States history. What I wanted to do today is from the perspective of three years after the accident, talk to you about what led up to the accident, what kind of a regulatory regime existed in the United States beforehand, and then spend most of, of my time talking about what we did in the immediate aftermath of the event to deal uh, with the crisis that the United States found itself in. So what was the U.S. regulatory approach uh, pre Macondo? Um, it was heavily prescriptive. It was a series of do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And there were many specifics associated with the prescriptive regime. And I've listed just a few of them there, pollution prevention and control, drilling, well completion, uh, and so on. It was a system that, um, in general terms, uh, is the U.S. regulatory model, not just in the offshore, not just in oil and gas, but really throughout uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, it's really a cultural and political artifact uh, as much as anything else. Now, with respect to oil and gas, and particularly offshore oil and gas, there had been periodic attempts to reconsider and change the regulatory regime. Accidents have a way of causing people to reconsider the existing set of rules and regimes. And that happened, for example, in 1989, where there was an accident offshore uh, Louisiana. An internal task force was convened within the Minerals Management Service, which was then the agency regulating offshore. In addition, the Marine part of the National Research Council uh, took a look at what the U.S. regulatory regime and specific rules were and made recommendations for trying to approach it in a more performance-based way, uh, for example, in the way that uh, countries like the U.K. and the Australia, in Australia currently do it. Um, unfortunately, those recommendations for reform were not heated. Um, it, they were overshadowed by a different kind of event, the Exxon Valdez in 1989. People started to focus on the risks of maritime accidents and uh, oil spill liability from moving vessels as opposed to the liabilities that could be created uh, from well explosions and blowouts. So the road to reform in the U.S. was uh, quite tragically paved by Deepwater Horizon. The blowout of the Macondo well, the sinking of the Deepwater uh, Horizon drilling rig, and the attendant loss of life and many, many serious injuries. And the spill of uh, close to five million barrels of oil into the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Um, the drama of it, I think, was magnified by the fact that it was televised live on CNN. And I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, in this room saw the sickening spectacle of oil continuing to flow uh, into the Gulf of Mexico for what turned out to be 87 uh, days. Now, almost immediately the accident triggered uh, prompt and a comprehensive re-examination of, of offshore regulation. Within a week of the accident, President Obama announced that he wanted one of his cabinet ministers, uh, Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar to prepare a report on, and you see the quote here, what if any additional precautions and technology should be required to improve the safety of oil and gas exploration and production operations on the outer continental shelf. And unlike most government projects, at least in the U.S., the 30-day report was actually delivered on time, uh, within 30 days. And the recommendations included a variety of different things, including immediate new prescriptive requirements uh, that it was felt could be uh, implemented immediately, 
than longer-term performance-based safety measures uh, that could be put in place. And finally, a set of ongoing working groups that would continue to focus on some long-term issues. In addition, and this was the most controversial part of these initial, initial steps, uh, a deep water drilling moratorium was imposed, originally imposed for six months, quickly overturned by a federal judge in Louisiana, and then just as quickly re-implemented in roughly the original form uh, for a period originally that was going to be six months. Now, why was the deep water drilling moratorium uh, imposed? Um, for several reasons, really. Uh, it allowed time, which was truly necessary, to implement some of the measures that were recommended in that 30-day report. It also provided time to gather information because so little was known early on about what had caused the explosion uh, and the oil spill. Time to gather information on what could be done to prevent future blowouts and spills through new regulations. What could be done to contain a subsea spill uh, and blowout once it had occurred? And what could be done to enhance oil spill response? which had not progressed very much at all since the days uh, of the Exxon Valdez. One of the things I was asked to do within a couple of weeks of coming on board at the Department of the Interior was to go around the country, go around the U.S., and to conduct a series of public forums, gathering information from knowledgeable people, from industry, from government, from environmental organizations, from local elected representatives, uh, trying to get their perspectives on what could be done, what should be done uh, to avoid another problem like Deepwater Horizon and to try to get the industry uh, back to work as quickly as possible. Based on the information that we gained through those public forums and the other information that was flowing in, including preliminary information about what caused the spill, we were able to, uh, as a formal matter, lift the moratorium in less than six months. In fact, it was list lifted after approximately five months in October of 2010. But we felt we were unable and we could not issue any further deep water drilling permits uh, until February of 2011. Now, what was the result of what I've described as this comprehensive reexamination of the offshore regulatory regime? Well, the many reviews and investigations that were conducted found uh, deep structural weaknesses in both industries and governments' attempts to adequately ad address these three legs of the uh, regulatory stool, that is prevention, containment, and spill response. What the accident did almost immediately and for some time thereafter was to serve as a wake-up call both the industry and the government, and to the public, most of which was really unaware of the extent of offshore uh, activity. It prompted uh, comprehensive reviews of existing technologies that were employed in the safety world, practices, risk management that was performed, as well as the specific regulations that were then enforced. And the overarching goal through all of this was to make both immediate and long-term improvements uh, in safety and environmental protection. Prompted both on industry's part and on the government's part, fresh uh, assessments of prevention, containment, uh, and spill response. So what were the initial regulatory steps? In the U.S., we have a tool in the offshore space called NTLs, or Notices to Lessees, these are not supposed to be new substantive regulations, but instead applications, guidance, interpretations of existing regulations. So the first important one after Deepwater Horizon was called NTL-5. It incorporated many of the safety recommendations in the 30-day report. It required for the first time a certification of compliance with all of the existing safety regulations by CEOs of the oil and gas companies that wanted to continue their activities. It required a certification for the first time by a professional engineer of the entire well casing and well cementing drilling program uh, that companies were engaging in. And it required third party verification and certification of blowout preventers. As I'm sure you recall all too well, the blowout preventer uh, on Deepwater Horizon failed completely 
which is one of the main reasons that this bill went forward and continued for so long. So NTL 5 was the first step. NTL 6, within 10 days of NTL 5 in June of 2010, was the next step. And what it was designed to get at was the need to get more information from oil and gas companies about worst case discharge. What would happen in the case of a blowout? How much oil might be spilled in the event of a blowout? Because what was learned immediately after Deepwater Horizon is that the estimates that had been in, in force for the Macondo well were completely unrealistic and completely inaccurate. And so a great deal more information was being sought on things like flow rate, total volume, maximum duration, uh, and so on. It also required companies to show very specifically how they would go about drilling a relief well uh, in the case of a blowout. And there was an emphasis on companies not only making representations that they could handle a blowout, but laying bare the assumptions and the calculations uh, that they were engaging in uh, as they presented information to the government. So those were the first two steps, uh, NTL-5 and then NTL-6. Uh, but the first sort of omnibus new safety regulation was something that we called the drilling safety rule. Now, normally in the U.S., when you have regulatory action that's put into place, there is a lengthy process of notice and comment that frequently can go on for as much as 18 months or even two years. We didn't have that time, kind of time here. And so we enacted this as an emergency rule, which was effective immediately. Now, it took some time to put together the rule, and so it was not completed uh, until approximately four months after the accident. But at the end of September of 2010, what we called the drilling safety rule, or the interim drilling safety rule, uh, went into effect. Um, it was uh, subsequently revised and slightly modified in August of 2012, after industry and other stakeholders, including environmental organizations, had a full opportunity to evaluate the rule as it had gone into effect and to make suggestions on how it might be changed. Um, it was a tribute, I think, to the rule drafters that even after a two-year review process, very little of the substance of the drilling safety rule uh, was changed. It contained elaborations of what had been in NTL-5 in terms of requirements for wellbore integrity, uh, and well control equipment, and I'll discuss the details of that uh, right now. So in terms of wellbore integrity, I won't go through all of these elements, but there were new requirements for casing, uh, new requirements for cementing, uh, there were new requirements for testing the integrity of both, uh, both casing uh, and cementing. There was the need for specific regulatory approval in cases in which lighter drilling fluids were sought to be used uh, by the operator. There was a requirement for far more substantial well control training than had previously been the case for most companies, uh, as well as tightening certain uh, technical requirements. So that, those were the new rules of the road with respect to well bore integrity. There were also, though, a whole set of uh, new requirements for well control equipment, including the mandatory submission of schematics for all well control systems on board a rig, uh, as well as a broad broadening of uh, BOP testing requirements. There were new requirements for uh, ROV capabilities as well as much more documentation that was required uh, in terms of subsea BOP inspections uh, as well as maintenance. And again, an emphasis on making sure that the people on board a rig that were responsible for well control equipment were adequately trained and had gone through drills to demonstrate the adequacy of their training. Now, the second element, remember I mentioned prevention, containment, and spill response. Um, containment turned out to be the element that was the most troublesome of them all because what had happened was industry and government together had entered what can only be described as a collective trance that a subsea blowout would simply never happen and therefore containment capabilities did not need to be developed. In retrospect, it's really an extraordinary blind spot, uh, but it was truly uh, a blind spot. And I'm sure many people in this room remember being plugged into what was going on in the U.S. with BP and the government 
and experts from other oil and gas companies trying a variety of methods to stop the oil from flowing uh, from the Macondo well. There was a containment dome that didn't work because hydrates collected on the containment do dome. There were nicknames given to various methods, including uh, throwing golf balls uh, into the well bore, uh, the top kill, the junk shot. Uh, none of that worked. It is, in some sense, one of the most painful public trial and error exercises that I've ever seen and probably that you've ever seen. Nothing seemed to work. Until finally, again, BP, together with expert advice from government people and other industry people, developed the capping stack. Now, if you've read any of the detailed reports about how the capping stack came to be and what the events were that led up to its being put in place, people were not confident uh, that it would work. Uh, there was a lot of fear that it would go the way of top kill, junk, the junk shot, or the containment dome. But it, the capping stack had been carefully fabricated. People had thought about it carefully. And thankfully, uh, it worked. It was lowered over the well bore, uh, and the oil finally stopped flowing uh, on July 15, 2010. In November of 2010, uh, we put out uh, for public dissemination a requirement that if any operator wished to operate in the deep water, they were going to have to demonstrate the kind of containment capabilities that belatedly BP was able to put into place uh, with the capping stack. Now, during this entire period, there was a tremendous amount of pressure that we were getting from local politicians as well as mostly mid-size and smaller oil companies saying, you've ended the moratorium, why won't you let us go back into the deep water? And the simple answer was, because you don't have containment capabilities. The only ca containment capability, the only capping stack known to work is sitting on the Macondo well. There aren't any others right now. So until you in industry can show us that you have these capabilities, that could deal with another blowout, if God forbid it would occur, we are not going to issue any further deep water permits. Now, industry really knew from almost the time of the original Macondo blowout that that would, as a matter of logic and common sense, have to be the government's position. And so starting in July, there was a public announcement of two separate industry-developed consortia that would develop containment capabilities. One was one run by the majors, and it was called the Marine Well Containment Company. The other was, was run by Helix, and it was called the Helix Well Containment Group. And those two consortia really worked separately, but together pushed forward to develop as quickly as they responsibly could uh, the capabilities to deal with containing uh, a subsea blowout. Uh, so that by, uh, by the end of the middle of February of 2011, they had demonstrated that to the satisfaction uh, of the government. In addition to the drilling safety rule that I talked to you about a few minutes ago, there had been percolating within the Department of the Interior for years a separate rule that was more aligned with the approach to regulation that you see in the UK, uh, Australia, and Canada. And that was something called the SEMS rule, or the Workplace Safety Rule. It was originally, it was originally talked about in the early 90s, but it was killed a number of times by industry opposition to it, uh, as well as the lack of, uh, of conviction of certain political representatives in the United States. But it had been reproposed in early 2009 before Deepwater Horizon. And that obviously, the blowout, the spill, the deaths, gave new life to this proposal, which otherwise might, might have died the, the same death that its predecessors had. Uh, and it was proposed and rolled out really at a, almost exactly the same time uh, as the drilling safety rule in the middle, end of September, middle of October 2010. Um, it is a big lift for many companies. And in recognition of that, the government agreed not to begin any enforcement actions against companies for violations of the SEMS rule uh, for a full year and, uh, and one month after it went into effect, so not until November of 2011. 
but companies were required to complete their first SEMS audit, their self-audit, if you will, by November 15th of 2013, so later this year. Now, the SEMS rule, and I won't go through all of these, uh, but it contains 13 separate elements. Originally, the proposed rule, and this rule did go through the normal notice and comment process, unlike the interim drilling safety rule, which was an emergency rule. The original SEMS rule, because people had modest ambitions before Deepwater Horizon, only contained four elements. But we were able to include, ultimately, uh, 13 elements in the final rule as it was promulgated. And I will just draw your attention to a couple of the specifics. Number three, the facility level hazards analysis and risk assessment that uh, each operator had to do with respect to its operations. The management of change program. Uh, which companies were required to do uh, to deal with facility and operational changes. Safe work practices, including uh, standards, rules of conduct, uh, and manuals that were relevant to different categories of people uh, working on rigs or other structures. Uh, and here are some of the other requirements of the SEMS rule. So 13 separate components of that rule. That was followed fairly quickly in September of 2011 by a proposed enhancement uh, to the original SEMS rule. You might ask if you were ready so quickly after the original SEMS rule, uh, why didn't you include it originally? And the answer was really a legal reason. It had not been part of any part of the proposal or discussion of the original proposal. And so as a matter of administrative law, it was viewed as a new requirement and therefore could not be imposed without notice and comment. And so one of the key features of the SEMS II rule was a requirement that the audits that I mentioned a few minutes ago would have to be conducted by a third party. Originally in SEMS I, companies were given the option of doing it themselves or having a third party do the audit. Uh, on reflection, we determined that uh, we would have a much higher level of confidence, as would the public, if a third party uh, did the audit. Uh, SEMS II becomes effective uh, just in a few weeks on June 4th, 2013, but that has no impact on the original deadline that companies must observe and obey to have conducted their first SEMS audit by November of 2013. Now, what you see with the NTLs that I've described, the uh, drilling safety rule, those are consistent with the United States historical prescriptive approach. But what I've just described with SEMS is new uh, because it is much more, as I mentioned, a performance-based system where companies are responsible for conducting the, uh, the brunt of the analysis that needs to be conducted. Now, in the immediate wake of Deepwater Horizon, there was actually quite a bit of controversy about whether the U.S. should do an about face and do a complete transformation of its regulatory model. Uh, and in fact, the original 30-day report that was submitted to President Obama recommended the adoption of the safety case, which is a performance-based regulatory regime, not a prescriptive-based regulatory regime. Um, in addition, the President's commission, um, the President appointed shortly after the spill, uh, completed its work and issued a, a terrific report in January of 2011. It too recommended that in regulating offshore activities that the U.S. government adopt uh, a safety case. Um, we fully considered that suggestion and that recommendation um, and we rejected it, uh, at least for now. Um, in part, it was a recognition that if you're going to change a regulatory model overnight, activity would almost of necessity need to come to a standstill for some extended period of time. A year, a year and a half, two years, we weren't sure. But we knew that the six-month deep water drilling moratorium would, it, would really just be a small down payment on the disruption and the interruption uh, that moving abruptly to a new regulatory model would cause. There was also the political and cultural fact in the U.S that the prescriptive model is the accepted model uh, across industries virtually without exception. 
and as many of you know, certainly those that have worked in the U.S., there is a significant percentage of the U.S. population that is deeply suspicious of and deeply hostile to oil and gas companies. And so the notion that you would transform the regulatory regime uh, so commonplace in the U.S., the prescriptive model, with a performance-based model and do it first in the oil and gas industry uh, where there is so much distrust struck me um, as completely unrealistic as a political and cultural matter. So what we did instead was take the first baby steps, if you will, towards developing a hybrid regulatory model, which still is predominated by prescriptive requirements, but now with SEMS and with SEMS 2 has performance-based elements uh, associated with it. And I think there is a very strong likelihood that there will be additional performance-based rules uh, that are developed by the current offshore regulatory agency, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see that to be the direction that the U.S. increasingly moves, but not overnight um, in the course of time. Well, you have these new regulations, um, you have to enforce them. Uh, and in order to enforce them credibly, you need a workforce in the regulatory agency that has technical expertise and the requisite knowledge. You also need to have resources given to the regulator, which had been a chronic problem from the, for the former Minerals Management Service and was only cured really, in the wake of Deepwater Horizon. I think we all see, as we watch governments perform and as we see private companies perform, sometimes it takes a tragedy, a tragic accident, to draw the attention of people to what's wrong and what additional resources needed to be provided. And what I learned, being new to the agency and really new to the industry, was that the regulatory agency in the U.S. had been consistently starved for resources for the full 20 year, 28 years uh, of its existence. So you need the resources, you need the technical expertise, but you also need the willingness of the regulator to aggressively enforce existing regulations. And that had not happened uh, in the United States. Uh, and so we had not seen what can be the positive deterrent effects of enforcement, where companies see regulatory action fair but aggressive regulatory action taken against one company and they say, you know what, we need to double down on what we're doing and make sure that we're following uh, all the rules. So in the U.S., it was acknowledged by all of the investigations and reviews that were conducted in the wake of Deepwater Horizon that strong enforcement had been missing, almost totally absent from offshore regulation. And it had really been a combination of a number of things, industry pressure, because the industry doesn't like enforcement. Uh, but Deepwater Horizon created the awareness of the importance of aggressive regulatory action in cases where companies are violating the rules. The other principal thing that we did, um, in addition to rolling out new requirements and rolling out new regulations, was really to completely reorganize the regulatory structures that existed for regulating offshore activity. Uh, the Minerals Management Service, which had been created in 1982, was hobbled throughout its existence by its conflicting missions. What were those conflicting missions? Well, they had to uh, generate the revenue from offshore activity. They had to make balanced resource decisions, deciding uh, what uh, leaseholds to uh, allow companies to develop. Uh, but it also had responsibilities for developing the appropriate regulations and enforcing those regulations. And despite the best and quite responsible efforts by many people in the agency historically, the agency was simply unable to keep pace with the challenges of overseeing industry that was operating in U.S. waters. So what we did was to replace the Minerals Management Service with independent agencies, three independent agencies, that were created to eliminate those embedded institutional conflicts of interest uh, that existed in MMS. So I'm only going to talk very briefly about two. The third one is something called the Office of Natural uh, Resource Revenue. And it is, its job is wholly 
to collect revenues that are generated by both offshore activity and onshore activity. But I'm going to focus and, and draw your attention to the two principal regulatory agencies that were created out of the reorganization. One, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which as you can see, is responsible for managing responsibly the development of the nation's offshore resources. And the second, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which is responsible for developing and implementing uh, both regulations as well as enforcing those regulations. So those are the two new, as of October 1, 2011, agencies responsible, primarily responsible, for regulating offshore activity. So this was a huge lift. We spent a tremendous amount of time doing it over the course of about 15 months. And so people can fairly ask, well, what did it accomplish? A lot of disruption, a lot of people uh, initially unclear, both in the government about what their new jobs would be, as well as in industry. Who do we deal with as we uh, engage in offshore activity? Well, we think it did a number of things. Um, first of all, unlike in the past, revenue collection no longer drives resource management decisions. A number of the investigations and reviews that were conducted showed conclusively that the top priority of MMS directors over time was to maximize revenue for the U.S. Federal Treasury. And that inevitably affected the ability of the agency to carry out its other missions. Resource management decisions no longer drive regulatory enforcement decisions because those responsibilities have been separated organizationally. And so the regulatory and enforcement capabilities can be developed without impeding and trenching on other missions. Um, the other, one of the other main things we sought to accomplish, though, uh, was to give environmental considerations appropriate weight during the making of resource management decisions. And you could hear that theme echoed in the Prime Minister's remarks a few minutes ago, because that's terribly important that environmental considerations as well as safety considerations be fully taken into account. And so we took a number of steps to really heighten the focus on environmental considerations, uh, which had been largely neglected over time in the operation of MMS. So, among other things, we created the first ever chief environmental officer um, in BOEM, one of the new agencies. We separated environmental reviews from leasing decisions uh, in BOEM. Um, and in BESI, we developed, for the first time ever, a dedicated environmental compliance unit to carry out enforcement actions against companies that were violating uh, the provisions of their leases, violating the promises that they had made in getting the rights uh, to engage in offshore activity. And there's also a new and more prominent role for oil spill response plans, which uh, for many years had been largely neglected uh, within the old MMS. So those are really the principal changes, and I would argue extraordinarily important changes uh, created by the reorganization. So what's the future uh, of offshore regulation uh, in the U.S.? Um, as I, I hope I've conveyed, um, we put into place in 2010 um, brand new prescriptive and performance-based regulations. We consider those, and I still consider them today, major advances uh, that raised the bar on safety and further protected the environment. Um, I think there was a concern at the time, a widespread concern in industry, that we would keep the new regulations coming, sort of like an endless hit parade, which would interfere with the predictability and stability of the regulatory regime. Uh, we recognized that. We pulled back a little bit. Um, and, and the result has been, uh, I think, a general understanding of the new requirements and acceptance that we, we have returned to a more stable and predictable uh, climate. Uh, indeed, since 2011, uh, the government has proceeded far more deliberately uh, in moving forward with any new requirements or new regulations. So in terms of what the future holds, I think future regulatory changes in the U.S. will depend on the new agencies carefully identifying uh, gaps and weaknesses um, in the current regulatory structure and following through on steps uh, to strengthen offshore regulation. One of the things that we learned was uh, this is a dynamic industry um, and regulators have to be uh, as dynamic as the industry. 
What had happened at MMS is that industry, for a variety of reasons, some of it resource-based, some of it expertise-based, had simply not kept pace with the enormous technological advances that had allowed industry to go into deeper and deeper water. We can't let that ever happen again uh, in the U.S. And one of the things we tried to do in the 17 months or so that I was in the U.S. government is to set up structures that would allow the government to keep pace uh, as industry uh, kept working in uh, increasing frontiers. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to any questions you may have after some of the other presentations. Thank you.